Hi, I'm Benton Stokes. And I'm Elaine O'Rourke. And this is Cocktail Theology. Hi there. Hi there. I've been sighing a lot when we sit down to do these things. <laughs> Why are you sighing? I don't know. I don't. You know, I think that what's been happening as we've been recording lately mm-hmm. is that we have been recording when I haven't seen you all day. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've been recording on Tuesday nights. And you're off doing your thing on Tuesdays, and I'm off doing my thing on Tuesdays, and then we come together on Tuesday evenings to record. Right. But what happens, I think, is I come into your presence with... Uh, the world yeah and then we talk this out a little bit and then i sit down i look at you and go (sighs) yeah like i get here right no i I totally understand that yeah my tuesdays are kind of crazy i'm all over the place on tuesdays it's really weird so So it's nice to settle in so hi happy tuesday happy tuesday we are drinking the fall cocktail (gasps) i finally decided this is the fall cocktail so done what i did because i got really obsessed one day Mm -hmm. was i made a number of different kinds of shrubs and shrubs are a fruit of some kind mm-hmm. and vinegar and sugar, which sounds weird, but tastes great. So I made a blackberry shrub and a cranberry shrub and I don't know, something else. I don't remember what the other one was. And then made syrups and made all this kind of stuff, just kind of went nuts. And we've been playing with them and whatever. And so finally I just I walked in tonight and said, this is the fall cocktail. <laughs> Mainly because I didn't want to think about it anymore. We now have named the fall cocktail. So what this is is it's actually a very slight modification on a cocktail by David Leibovitz, who is a food writer and cook, whom I adore, lives in Paris with his partner. He had posted this cranberry shrub cocktail, so I stole it and messed with it. But it's basically the cranberry shrub Mm -hmm. and bourbon Mm -hmm. and a little bit of maple syrup. Mm. Mm. And then the thing that shifts it a little bit off of what he did, besides the fact that I made my shrub differently, is those Aztec chocolate bitters are in it. Oh, right. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. It's lovely. It's a lovely it's thing. Very so that's nice. the fall cocktail. If the cranberry bourbon shrub cocktail based on David Leibovitz's version, and I will put a link in the cocktail theology stuff. Nice. I like it a lot. It is incredibly tasty. It is tasty. It is. So this week, we are continuing talking about what we were talking about last week, which was what are we talking about when we're talking about whatever it is we're talking about. Yes. For those of you who didn't listen to the one last week, where we were talking about what it is you're talking about when you're talking about things, (laughs) (laughs) and how we're very often not talking about what it is we think we're talking about, we're actually talking about different problems. And the idea is basically this, that... Often when we get excited about something, it isn't actually that thing we're excited about or upset about. It's what it represents. It's the history of it. It's all those other things. So if I get excited about a road trip for goat cheese, part of it is the fact that I love road trips and I love goat cheese and I love traveling with you. Part of it is the getting away. Yeah. And so, you know, we may be talking about the details of a road trip, but I'm also in the back of my head going, and it's five hours away. You know, that (laughs) kind of thing. Right, right. So it's that sense of, uh, what are we talking about when we're talking about whatever it is we're talking about? So this week we are talking about what it is we're talking about when we're talking about sexuality. Yes. Particularly other people's sexuality. Particularly other people's sexuality. Because we, I I don't mean you and I, Mm -hmm. although you may be, I don't know, we haven't had this conversation. We are obsessed with sexuality. Mm Mm-hmm in our country, in our culture. Oh, sure. I don't think that's different than it's ever been, honestly. I think we just show it differently. Mm -hmm. But we are obsessed with other people's sexuality, particularly, Mm -hmm. whether it's normative for our own. Mm -hmm. If you think about the cover of something like Cosmopolitan Mm -hmm. magazine, are you getting sex 2.3 times a week? Are you average? You know, whatever that is. Right. Like, there's some normative thing we should be thinking about. I think the way it is about our own is in that, is this normal? Right. Are you doing it right? Are you doing it right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, there's that. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because there's plenty of advice on that. (laughs) Right. But you're right that the issue that we wanted to talk about tonight was what are we talking about when we're talking about other people's sexuality? What is it that really, really matters to us? And in a Christian context, 
from which both of us come and survive and live now, live and thrive and have our being and all of that, it takes on all kinds of extra yes, meaning. Yes, it does. From the conversations about purity and what that means to conversations about the roles of men and women in the home and in the world, to conversation about homosexuality, to conversations about procreation, to all of that kind of stuff. It becomes this big morass of confusing conversation. Absolutely. So I think the way I want to go about this is to look at each of those things a little bit and tease out what it is we're talking about Mm -hmm. and see if there's a theme to Mm -hmm. this. And I think for Christians, this may be true for Jews too, but I don't know since that's not my tradition. For Christians, there is the illusion that our ideas about sexuality come from the Bible. And I think that's false. I think when we get sanctimonious about how other people are behaving in their sex lives, Mm -hmm. we will credit the Bible for our point of view or use the Bible as a means to defend our point of view. But I don't think our point of view actually comes from the Bible at all. I would lean that direction as well. Yeah, so there's that sense of sanctimoniousness, that sense of there is a a correct attraction, a correct methodology, frankly, Mm -hmm. a correct longevity, a correct time to start, time to end. There's a correct. Mm -hmm. And often in the Christian traditions, we talk about it as if that is dictated somewhere in the Bible. And then when people go looking for that somewhere in the Bible, they wind up pulling out all kinds of things, and then which actually kind of creates a mishmash. So a number of years ago now, I was on a panel at a conference about faith and sexuality. Big conference, and I was on the panel about, I don't remember what I was on the panel about. But I wound up saying something that became fairly controversial, and like if you go digging for stuff about me on the (laughs) internet, this comes up, one of the things that comes up. And during the panel, I got asked the question, something about bisexuality. And I said, the Bible doesn't address bisexuality. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't. So what we have to do is extrapolate from our general understandings of sexuality and that kind of thing. Right. And I got laid into by a number of Mm. Christian reporters. Ah, yeah. And then somebody else brought up the the concept of polyamory in a committed relationship. So being involved with a number of people in a single committed relationship, Uh that, that kind of idea. Okay. Rather than being involved with a number of people not in a committed relationship. Anyway, so like three or four people in a committed relationship. And I said, again, the Bible doesn't address this. There may be an underlying opinion, but it is not directly addressed in the Bible. So -hmm. so to say the Bible says is actually just false. And again, I took lots of heat for that. So I say all of that because those questions weren't coming out of nothing. People were were not asking these questions as an intellectual, well, what do you think? As somebody who studied the Bible significantly, what does the Bible say about it? They weren't, they're not doing that. They're not asking what color was the dress on which the scarlet letter was sewn, right? Mm-hmm. They're not asking that. What they're asking is, how can I either justify who I know myself to be or how can I condemn other people for being who they are? Those are the only two reasons to ask those right. questions. Right, and by condemning other people, you're justifying yourself. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's really kind of shocking how little the Bible says about these things. Mm-hmm. That's right. And if you look through the Bible at the various couplings throughout it, you've got a bunch of incest, you've got multiple marriages. You've, it's a very wide range because it's a very long-ranged book. Yes. As we talk about all the time, 66 books, books on a shelf over a couple of thousand years. Right. You get vastly different cultures. Right. During that period of time Absolutely. and different ways of thinking about it. And as we have often talked about, you know, there's a big whole chunk of what Christians call the Old Testament that is mostly about how to run a society. Mm-hmm. How do you run a group of people who are supposed to be different than the surrounding mm-hmm. people? Mm-hmm. That's very different than saying this is morally in some kind of godly way right. This is morally in some kind of godly way wrong. It's often about, okay, <laughs> don't run red lights. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of thing. So to look across the Bible, we get examples from the people we idolize of all different kinds of relationships, all different kinds of sexuality. 
And that's without even extrapolating from some of the more tantalizing things like David's relationship with Jonathan, which you know has been speculated about many, many, many times. But without even going there, you've just got this huge wide range. So I think that people don't ask the question about it unless they're either trying to make sure that what they're doing is okay or are trying to make sure that what somebody else is doing isn't. You grew up in Bible land and I didn't, so. Did you grow up with like the purity stuff? Was that a movement when you were growing up? For those of you who aren't aware of this, there's been a movement in a number of Christian denominations and, and social milieu to get mostly girls, but also boys, to commit themselves to virginity until their time they're right, married. Right. So they take purity promises, their purity rings, their purity ceremonies, there are all these different kinds of things trying to emphasize the importance of not having sex until the time you're married, although exactly what that means is not completely clear most of the time. Mm-hmm. No, I didn't. Um, I mean, I grew up with that as an expectation. Right. My parents and I didn't talk about sex, so that conversation didn't happen. I didn't get that expectation from them. But I did put that expectation on myself. I did choose to remain a virgin until I was married. However, I mean, you can define virgin a few different ways. <laughs> right, which is a whole different question, right. right? The purity thing happened somewhere between me and my kids. Okay. We were attending a, a Southern Baptist church, and that movement started in the Southern Baptist church, uh, the True Love Waits idea, where you make a right. pledge when you're a teenager. Sometimes there's a ring involved. It was essentially accountability. I'm going to get up in front of my youth group and my peers, and I'm going to say that I'm going to be chaste until marriage, and I'm going to have this symbol that I'm going to wear that's going to remind me that I said that I'm going to be chaste until marriage. Right. And... I don't think that the church did a great job or does a great job, and I don't just mean the Southern Baptist Church, I mean the church as a rule, does a great job of explaining the whys, why you should be chaste until marriage. I think they just say that's what you're supposed to do. Right. They'll say, you know, sex outside of marriage is bad, mm -hmm. but they won't give you hard evidence as to why it's bad. Right. Like, for instance, sex education in schools. Mm -hmm. Many Christians get up in arms about the way sex education is taught, but in sex education, you get the reasons why you should either abstain or protect yourself. Right. And there are hard reasons why. Right. But the church doesn't really get into that part of the conversation. Okay. The church just says, you should remain chaste. You should be able to offer yourself to your partner as someone who is pure, who hasn't experienced this with anyone but them. And then you share that as something that's that's endorsed by God because you waited. Right. I mean, I accepted that that was a choice that I should make for myself. Mm -hmm. I had friends who also made that choice and I had friends who didn't make that choice. Mm -hmm. I think the reasons why I made that choice were layered. Sure. And just because I remained a virgin didn't mean that I didn't have sexual struggles, that I was quote unquote pure when I got married because right. I think pure again is something well, that, that you that can't mean? really define. Right. And I don't think the church does a good job of coming around to that either right. and explaining it to kids right. as to why it's important. Right. So within the context of the church that I grew up in, it was an expectation, but it wasn't really discussed. Mm -hmm. We didn't really talk about it. Mm -hmm. And the True Love Waits movement hadn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. So it hadn't really risen to the surface of youth group mm -hmm. conversation. So yeah, it wasn't a thing other than just a decision that I made and felt some sense of conviction about mm -hmm. at the time. Sure. I don't think there's anything, I just want to be really clear, there's nothing wrong with remaining a virgin until you're married. No, okay. of course not. There's nothing wrong, well I want to be clear from, from my end of the mm -hmm. world, there's nothing wrong with that. Th at all. <laughs> I really hope my daughter, <laughs> in fact, I hope she stays a virgin until the day she dies and then she dies very old. <laughs> um, no, I'm just kidding. But there, you know, there's nothing wrong with that piece, right? The piece is... What are we actually? What are we talking? actually talking about? Right. You know, when we're telling our kids this about being gay, or this about being bisexual, or this about being transgender, although that's a whole different category of things, or this about positions, or this about, it's like one of the things that <laughs> has always sort of annoyed me in the more common conversation is the idea that there is quote unquote gay sex, mm -hmm. as if 
what gay men would do together is not something that straight people couldn't mostly do together anyway. Right. Those kinds of weird things we do with our brains in order to decide what's right and wrong mm -hmm. becomes this heap of stuff. As one is choosing to not have, I'm going to be really specific, we should put in not, not safe for work. Right. On this, right? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> not safe for your kids, not safe for work. But if one is choosing to not have sexual contact below the waist with another person mm -hmm. until you're married, because that's really kind of what it comes down to is there's sure. something about the waist, right? Yeah. Then figuring out why it is, at least as adults, why it is that, why it's that, what is about that that we care about? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that sometimes people attribute it to the whole present your body as a living sacrifice yeah. thing. Well, that's not what Paul meant, mm -hmm. like, in any way. So understanding what it is we want from people when we're talking about any kind of sexuality, I think, matters a lot. And it's on these sorts of things, like the way we talk to kids, that it becomes really clear that yeah. we don't really know what it is we're actually talking about when we're talking about yeah. it. We're trying to give them a moral code. We're trying to keep them safe from whatever it is we're afraid of. Yeah. I no longer have the, the arguments over the Bible with people, ever. Yeah, they're useless. They're completely useless. Mm -hmm. And they're useless even on innocuous passages. Yeah. But particularly when people are feeling deeply about something, you know? And I think that people of goodwill and good intentions can read exactly the same passages and come up with very different things. Oh, of course. You know? Right. The fact is this. There are 66 books in the Bible. Some of them are meant as law. That means formation is what it really means. Some of them are letters that are meant to keep a particular community in line some of them are stories, some of them are poetry, some of them are all different kinds of things. There is no single definition of correct sexuality or whether you're talking about orientation or behavior or activity or anything other than the admonitions to love and respect other people. Mm -hmm. That's the only consistent one. Right. The rest is either have eight wives Mm -hmm. or stone the prostitutes. But other than that, there's no... Right. It's just not there. It's not there. So when we're talking about what Christian sexuality is, most of the time, we're not talking about the Bible. No. No, we're not. At all. The whole idea of Christian sexuality kind of makes me giggle a right. little bit. Now, Sam, no, wait a minute. <clears throat> you know that I teach on Christian sexuality. I, I do. <laughs> do. I do. You, you rarely but, giggle. But, yeah, I do. <laughs> No, but yeah, Christians have sex. Right. Christians are sexual creatures because humans are sexual creatures. If you take two heterosexual guys, one's a Christian and one is not, there's really not that much difference. Right. And honestly, there may not be any difference in their activities. They may say, or they may give you the impression that there are differences. Sure. You know, the Christian may imply or, or allow you to infer that there are differences between his sexual habits, attractions, et cetera, right. from the heathen down the street, right? Right. But the, the fact is, right. there's probably not any difference or very little right. difference. Right. So Christian sexuality is really just human sexuality. Now, you can put restrictions on yourself based on your belief system, your value system. You can decide that sex is for procreation, you may say that that's the only reason why, and that may be a reason why you can say gay people are bad because they're having sex and not to procreate. Right. So it's not biblical, obviously, because the Bible says you only have sex to procreate. Except it doesn't. Except it doesn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it's like sex is not supposed to be fun. Sex is not supposed to give pleasure. Sex is not supposed to be right. anything except... Duty. Duty. D-U-T-Y. <laughs> Duty. Because that would be in the range of... <laughs> that, would, that would fit in that other column way over there. And, and there's no condemnation in this None. room on the other column, but it would be a None. different None, and there are Christians that do that. Uh, you bet. <laughs> you bet. our ideas about sex around what our parents taught us, what society teaches us, what we 
gather mm -hmm. as kids, as adolescents, whatever, and what we experience, not from what the Bible says. We can use the Bible to underline our positions, to support our positions, and to even clobber those who don't have our positions. But we don't actually get what we think about our, our bodies or sexuality from the Bible at all. Yeah, and I want to give an example of that. I completely agree, obviously. I want to give an example of this. Yeah, please. Very, very, very young children use their hands and their mouths to discover the world. Yes. At some point, they start discovering their own bodies. Now, even before the time that they are sexually aware, they discover that different parts of their bodies give them different sensations. Yeah. The first time you discover your small child touching his or her groin area, what you're probably going to say, if you don't overreact, is something like, I know that that's good. That's a private thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with it, but, we, but it's private. We just mm -hmm. don't, we don't drop trow and Kroger, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean... In our house, anyway, <laughs> we, don't talk, we don't do that, right? But at the second you do that, kid says, ah, this is not a public thing. Yeah. And as soon as something is not a public thing, it becomes a whole other kind of thing. Right. So you don't even have to talk about sex. You've made sexuality a private thing. And I'm all for that. Don't get me wrong. But as a result, it carries with it a weight it does. And an importance that has nothing to do with the Bible or with natural human sexuality or whatever. It has to do with the fact that we have a sense of what is private and what is public. So as kids get older and we keep having the private public conversations, and again, if we're trying to give them healthy sexuality but not too young sexuality, yes. we're again having these conversations about respecting your body, all of that kind of stuff. They don't get taught about biblical sexuality, I'm using that in very broad scare quotes, biblical sexuality until far beyond the time they've already got a sense of what sexuality Absolutely, is. Absolutely, right. So it's clear that whatever they're getting is not strictly from the Bible. It's mm -mm. from my, if I am interpreting the Bible, it's from my interpretation of the Bible. It is. And so forth. So I think that as people of faith, in some ways, we have to set aside the Bible as being our litmus test of whether something is good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. We can go and look through the Bible for wisdom on this, mm -hmm. see what the general sensibilities are, try mm -hmm. and understand what Paul was talking about when he was talking with Corinthians. There was a reason he was making these points. Right. We can do that, but we cannot say homosexuality, bisexuality, any of these things in and of itself is anti-biblical. Mm -hmm. One of the examples that I like to give when I'm talking about this with people, I'll say something like, two women in a committed loving relationship other than Ruth and Naomi, which we can talk about in a different context, other than that, is not talked about in Scripture at all. Absence from Scripture does not mean condemnation. Right. Very important. And the example that I use is baseball is not in the Bible. Wow, you're right. I know. There's no baseball in the Bible. Now, for people who take the Bible very, very literally, there are sects that do, they're not going to play baseball because it's not in Because there. it's not in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. The rest of us think that the Bible doesn't have anything to say about baseball, mm -hmm. period. Now, the Bible may have stuff to say about sexuality, but it does not address what we would normally call loving, committed relationships. Right. It just doesn't. There's a lot of condemnation of divorce, mainly because divorce meant that a woman would be destitute and would either usually either starve to death or have to become a prostitute. Mm -hmm. You know, there's that kind of conversation. But there's not much other than that. Right. So I think that what we're talking about when we're talking about sexuality, in a Christian context specifically, is whatever it is we think the cultural mores are or we think that God wants us to be like. When you were talking about restrictions earlier that we might place on ourselves, I think it is completely appropriate to try and discern what God might want from us. Of course, in Having, every area of our lives. In every mm -hmm. area of our lives, whether or not the Bible talks about it. Of course. Okay. So... If baseball isn't in the Bible, but I go over and I hit somebody with my bat because I've struck out, the Bible may not talk about hitting somebody with my bat, but generally speaking, we would assume that the Bible would not be on the side of my randomly attacking people with an aluminum object. Right. Generally. Yeah, because there's plenty of passages about how you treat your neighbor, how you treat other people. So, once we get there, then what we're saying is, okay, 
how am I to live in the world? What does it mean for me to live a good life? What do I think that God wants from me? Mm -hmm. And that's going to include my baseball habits. It's going to include my sexuality. It's going to include all of these, what, what kind of companies I buy from. It's going to include how I talk to people in the grocery store. Right. Whether I yell at NFL players. I mean, it's, it, it's going to include all of that. Everything. It's all part of that. One thing that I want to say about the Bible specifically is that I grew up memorizing the Bible. I grew up with Bible quizzing where we were asked questions and we answered questions. And the Bible is, is something that I treat with a great deal of reverence. And I, I realize that I've said a lot about what the Bible doesn't say. But the fact is we need to understand what it doesn't say as much as we do what it does say. Mm -hmm. However, what you're saying about how we choose to live our lives based on how we read the Bible, that's important. Yes. When you pay attention to what you're reading, take it in context and allow it to speak to your spirit, mm -hmm. that's where you gain the wisdom that you need to govern your life mm -hmm. in everything that mm -hmm. you do. And the way that I read it is not necessarily the way that you read it mm -hmm. or the way that my neighbor reads it mm -hmm. or the way that my kids read it. Even when they hear about how to read it from me, mm -hmm. they're still going to learn how to read it themselves for themselves and extrapolate from it what they extrapolate mm -hmm. from it. So when people use the Bible and say, this is what it says, well, no. Very rarely. Very rarely. The Bible is not that cut and dried about everything. Right. So in my opinion, it's just really wrong and really hurtful to take the Bible and use it for your own ends, for your own devices, particularly when you're taking aim at someone else yes. and saying, you can't do this right. because this is what the Bible says about right. what you're doing. Right. And I think so much about sexuality is not anywhere in the Bible. And many people will take something and interpret it, twist it, whatever they have to do to rain down condemnation on somebody that's doing something that they just personally don't like, don't understand, and don't think's okay. Right. I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. I think I told you recently that in one of my old churches, I had a parishioner who talked to me about the real story of John the Baptist. He was very adamant with me that in the passages where John the Baptist is introduced, that he eats honey and locusts. This parishioner told me how locust referred to locust bean, what we would call carob. Oh. Okay. And so what it really meant was that John the Baptist was living in the wilderness eating honey and carob. And I looked at him, I said, yeah, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think he's eating locusts. Mm -hmm. Like, bzz, bzz, locusts. <laughs> Cicadas. Cicadas. Right. In Franklin. When you right. Down your <laughs> that salad. rained down on your salad. <laughs> and he spent a good five minutes telling me how important it was that I understood this. And probably about minute two and a half, what I really realized is this is a man who could not accept the idea that somebody might eat locusts. Because it just grossed him out. Because it grossed him out. Right. Now, it's supposed to gross you out. Uh huh. That's the reason that, that they talk John about John the Baptist it. was kind of gross. He was, yeah, right? It's supposed to gross you out. So this guy spent time trying to convince me, essentially, that John was A, a vegetarian. Uh -huh. <laughs> which, yay, but no, that John was a vegetarian and that really he was eating honey and carob, right? With a knife and, and fork? Right, with a knife and fork. No, 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 no. That's, this is why it matters. This is why it matters. So, so he was reading the Bible literally. literally. Okay? So it's not like he was misinterpreting. He was reading the Bible literally. But his inability to imagine that John the Baptist uh -huh. would eat locusts had nothing to do with the Bible. It had to do with what I have called for a very long time now, the ick factor. His own ick factor. His own right. ick factor. Right, right, And friends, if you're listening to this, if you take away nothing else, take away the idea that our ick factor is the strongest determinant of what we think is sexually moral of anything. Yeah. So, if I have the conversation with somebody about homosexuality and heterosexuality in the Bible, and 
they go with me along on the passages and how, you know, this word actually never meant homosexuality. The word homosexuality wasn't even invented until the 19th century and go through all of these things. And we get to Paul and I say, this is the only one that actually can be interpreted this way. Here's what Paul was likely talking about, but I reserve judgment on that one. They can go with me on all that, understand all that. And then they will say to me, I hear all of that, but I still feel like it's wrong. I'm like, that's your ick factor. Yeah. It's because you can't imagine how that could be right because either it's not what you feel mm -hmm. or you feel it and feel bad that you feel it. Right. It's that ick factor. I think the ick factor is far more involved in our understanding of right and wrong when it comes to sexuality and eating, for that matter. Isn't it more about normal and not normal than right and wrong? Oh, yeah. Because well, normal is your frame of reference. Normal is what is within your safe box. Yeah. And if you can, if you behave yourself in the way that is within this box, mm -hmm. then you're normal. Well, right. And if you're outside that box, then you're not normal. And right. not normal is not okay equals wrong. And I think that you can make the argument that not normal doesn't necessarily mean wrong. There may be moral wrongs that are perfectly normal. For example, as someone who follows in the way of Jesus, I have to pay attention to the fact that it may be completely normal for me to swear at the driver who's honking behind me. That's normal. It is not, however, the way I want to be. Right. No, no, no. I totally okay. understand that. So but but that. I think that fits inside that box. Yeah. This is morality. This is okay. Right. This is, I think all that fits inside that box. Right. Many Christians, uh, alcohol doesn't fit inside their box. Right. So if you drink... Right. You're outside the box and you're wrong for drinking or right. at least not okay or not as okay as you should be. Right. <laughs> right. And sexuality gets treated the same way. Exactly. And the box gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The more fearful you are of your own desires, your own feelings, the world's morality, the more fearful you are of chaos, your box gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Now, I want to be really clear for anybody who's listening. I think there are right and wrong sexual actions, but they have to do mostly with consent, abuse, the ability to choose. They have to do with those kinds of things. Absolutely. And whatever vows we've made. Right. So if I have vowed to my partner that I will be monogamous and that we agree, or at least I know what I mean by monogamous, and I've made it clear to my partner what I mean by monogamous, if I choose to then not be monogamous, I've broken a vow. Right. It's not about what I did. Right. It's about the vow. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so the question then, when we're talking about sexuality, what are we talking about when we're talking about sexuality? It really depends on what it is we're talking about. Yeah. Am I talking about breaking vows? Am I talking about wanting to enjoy my partner without having a child? Mm -hmm. Am I talking about finding somebody else attractive and feeling guilty about it? Mm -hmm. Am I talking about the fact that we are sensual beings and... If I were to imitate my three-year-old and explore my body with my hands, would I be committing a sin? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is we're talking about, we have to figure out what it is we're talking about. And it's almost never actually about faith or about the Bible or even really about sexuality. It's about how we want to parse up the world, how we want to box it, how we want to make sense out of it. Right, right. And there's nothing wrong with having a box. Mm -hmm. Everyone has a box. Right. The box is your frame of reference. The box is your experience. That's right. The box is what you learn from your parents, from your social group, from your peers. It's what you read in the Bible yep. and how you experience that. It's all of those things and everybody has a box. Yep. What can become a problem is how we treat others who don't live in our own box. When your idea of okay and my idea of okay are not right. the same and kingdoms start ramming into one another as they right. do. Right. What do we do about that? Right. And what role do we allow the Bible to play in that? Right. Do we pick it up and hurl it at somebody right. because they're outside of our box? Right. And that's the thing that's not okay. If there's anything that the Bible is consistent about, it's the two greatest commandments. Mm -hmm. Love God, love your neighbor. Mm-hmm. And if you're not treating the person outside of your box well, there's a problem. There's a problem. So mostly what we're doing when we're talking about sexuality is talking about our own personal ick factors. Yeah. And then if we are dealing with that, then we can start having actual conversations about it. Yeah.
So, what do you guys think? Uh, we always want to know what you think. Mm -hmm. If we push some hot buttons for you, then tell us about that. We mm -hmm. would love to hear about that. We would love to answer any questions you have about anything that we've said. If you are someone who feels somehow outside or ostracized because of something intrinsic to you, like your sexuality, and you want to talk to somebody about that, we can be that person and people, or we can direct you to people mm -hmm. to talk to about that. We want you to hear this loud and clear. God does not hate you. That's right. So if there's something that you have done or something that you are or think you are, even if nothing around you and no one around you is saying that you're okay, mm -hmm. you need to hear that God knows that you're okay. Yep. God believes you're okay. Absolutely. And if you want to talk to somebody about that, we can help you with that. The easiest way to do that is to go onto the School for Secrets website, schoolforsecrets.com, scroll down a little bit to where there's a box where it talks about the fact that we like to talk with people. You can just go get on our calendars just by clicking that box and going in. We do one free half an hour consult with anybody. So just get onto our calendars and we will have a conversation with you. And if you just want to bring up ideas, by all means, please find us on cocktailtheology.com. Find us on the website, find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, whatever you want to do. We want to hear from you. And we particularly want to hear from you if you are feeling alone and scared or wounded, any of those things. Right. Because God doesn't want you to feel that way. And nope. we don't either. Exactly. Uh, we appreciate your support. You can support us a number of different ways. One is by subscribing to this podcast. One is by sharing us in your socials. Please. One is telling your friends mm -hmm. and one is listening. Mm -hmm. And we have a bunch of episodes now. So uh, you can go back if this is the first one you've heard and hear lighter topics from <laughs> us and hear funny stories and things that we've done. So there, there's lots to listen to and share. So uh, we encourage you to do that. Patreon is another way that you can do that financially for us. Patreon.com slash cocktail theology is a way that you can support us in a financial, tangible kind of way. And we appreciate that, too. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, we are at schoolforseekers.com, cocktailtheology.com, elaineorourke.com, bentonstokesmusic.com. Follow us in the socials and do all that stuff. We would love to know you better, hear from you, and be of use. Absolutely. Happy fall, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.